Hi, everyone. How is everybody today? I think it's a great time to have a conference. You know why? December, time to be reflective. Everybody is here to learn. And you probably really want to be here. If not, you'll be in holidays or somewhere. So I, I hope to give you something um, meaningful and helpful today. So when I talk about lean design, what I really mean is about being fast, using the lean design process successfully. And nothing motivates me than end of the year and I ask myself one question. And let, let me do a little exercise. As you go into 2018, you're probably going to add one more year into your resume. So in your head, think about how many years of experience do you have Everyone have a number in your head already? You're looking very serious, like, how many years has it been? So that year, maybe it's just show of hands, how many years is it? Don't be shy. How many years of experience do you have? Working experience. <laughs> is it not enough hands, then never mind, just put it as that. <laughs> A little bit sensitive, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that, you know, time is relative. So this is a question I ask myself and motivate myself. So let's just imagine I have 10 years and you just substitute that years of experience over there. Do you really have 10 years of experience or five years of experience or four years of experience? Or do you really have one year of experience multiplied by 10? What does it mean? Well, when I first started my career, I was basically repeating every year over and over again. I wasn't learning much. We go through the same peer review, um, talk to my manager, expecting an increment every year. But I wasn't really learning. And the worst thing is that I didn't know that I wasn't learning until I stumbled into this process called Lean, and specifically Lean Startup. So what happened in, when I started learning? This was the, when I started working, this was the product development process. It's very long, I won't go into details, but the gist is that if you want to launch any feature, it takes you at least six months. And six months for a validated learning, some of you would be like, what? The, what? How could any company deal with such cycle? But some of you who are in bigger enterprise, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, that sounds about right. This is the time it takes to, sp to launch any product. And in comparison, Lean Cycle is much simpler. It's so easy to, to remember. Basically, learn, build, measure. And the time you need to go through the cycle is as soon as possible, which itself is a problem, because what is as soon as possible? But this effective process, if you, if you compare it with a six-month cycle, it means that if you are a developer or a designer working on a lean process, the amount of validated learning you have in a year is much more than someone who is using Waterfall, for example. Because time, it's fixed, but it's porous. It really depends on how much experience you can squeeze into there. And lean is designed to be Accelerated is designed to help you learn much faster. So this is simple enough to understand. The question is, why isn't more enterprise using Lean? And why isn't more designers effective? And I feel like I realized that now we have another problem. The problem is Lean is very popular, and everybody wants a stake in Lean. So you have your Lean UX, you have design thinking, design sprint, Agile, and what happens is each of these groups are running their own cycle. And if you add them together, it's impossible to meet your as fast as possible time frame. So when you get the agencies to do design thinking, pass it on to your lean designers about a month, two months. If you need to call for tender for bigger companies, it could take up to six months. And then you have your Agile and, and your Scrum. And finally, you got to people 
to, who does lean analytics, growth hacking and so on, this cycle becomes a lot longer and we're back to the same problem. It's a new type of waterfall. So I would urge everybody to just forget, of, don't be too egoistic about your own process and really go back to the roots of lean startup. The rules of the games. Speed. So ASAP, again, is ambiguous. What I want to do here is I'm going to share the time, the time box or the time we use to do each of the steps, each of the design process in SP design to let you, I'm not saying that it's going to be the right time frame, but to let you compare as a designer, you know, how fast can you get? Speed is really a competition with yourself. It's a change in mindset. And second rule, validation. So getting the final or the minimum viable product to the users is crucial. It means that although you can do your qualitative research, you can learn as much, the cycle doesn't actually end until it gets to the hand of the users and, you, and moves a metric. So if you say your cut sorting or A-B testing is a sort of quantitative analysis and it fits the lean cycle, I'm here to tell you, not, not really. And I go into that later. At this point, I would show you, illustrate the process that we use. I think it's quite common in a lot of startup um, agencies as well. And what I'm going to do differently is I'm going to put a time frame on each of these activities. So for learning, it always starts with the people that you are designing for and the solutions to meet those needs. But for a larger company, it also includes your stakeholders. So at the beginning of every design sprint, design ticket, it's very important to get alignment with the stakeholders. So this is something that we do. It's adapted from design sprint, but it is a more concise version of it because a lot of the times we are not designing a new, completely new product. We are doing feature sprint or feature optimization. So we can do with less time. Number, one, number one, that, that column, it's all about understanding your user, sorry, understanding your business, understanding your product success matrix. So every business would have their own business goal. I would say if you want to be completely user-centered, then offer everything for free. But we're not a charity. Most companies are not charity. So it's very important to get what business goals do they have this, this year? this three years, this five years, and link it back to a product success matrix. Because if it's not linking, if your business owner is not making the connection, then we're gonna have a problem in the, in the future when we come out with a product and it doesn't actually generate any revenue. So f this part, let the PO or the business owner take charge and let them explain. And then we'll review current matrix. Next, if you have a user journey map, it's helpful to flesh it out and say where does this fit in the user journey. If it's increasing engagement, then it's probably somewhere in the middle. If it's increasing users, it's probably somewhere upstream. So every know, everyone knows in which part of the journey this lies. Next, sketching. This is usually the fun part where we get everybody to draw the solutions Say if your user story is, I want to increase transaction, or I want to increase payment. The solutions that I have in my head is going to be very different from the one that you have in your head. So to reduce the risk of just drawing new designs and then going back and forth, it's, it's much less risky to get them to draw what they exactly mean, and then we discuss from there. So we have a bit of a desktop research. We'll go through online, Pinterest, we go through our app and see which are the solutions that fit the problem. Then we will do a little show and tell. Then we come out as many ideas as possible. And finally, we decide which ideas we want to focus on. Those ideas with voted dots will go into the prototype and will be tested with our users. Next, prototyping. Four hours. Anything more, it's too long. 
So you have to be really fast at this. And later I'll tell you how to be much faster at prototyping. So take four hours, get everybody in the room together, and just hash the prototype out. This takes a day because the second part of the day, you actually need to schedule an appointment with your users and ensure that they turn up the next day. So the next day, interview five users. This is very familiar because it is something that um, Google Design Sprint have. We adopt that, and I've used that for many, many cycles already. It works well for me. And five act value, so always a friendly welcome, context questions, then we will do the concepts. There are certain tasks for existing designs, and we will get them to, to do a little bit of usability testing and then debrief. It's very, it seems simple, but a lot of the details are in the practice. So the first time you are doing one-on-one -on -one research, you're probably going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but the more time you do it, the more you master it, and it's very important, then you get better at it. And finally, one day of recommendation and design refinement. From experience, this part is usually the part where we lose momentum. We're like, oh, yay, we have all these insights. Let's sit on it for a while, and then the next week, let's look at how we refine our existing design, but do it the next day. So document the findings and recommendation, maybe in a Word document or presentation, where you should then talk it through with your stakeholders and then send it along, share it. And then finally, the real work for designers. Everybody thought designers is just this part. Design the high fidelity design to be developed. How do you learn faster? Okay, there's a plethora of tools that we can use, ethnographic studies, contextual inquiry. If you are using the lean mindset, you will know that you have to not even consider ethnographic study because it doesn't fit. I think the value in lean is that whatever you learn can be tested in the next week. So it actually, it actually validates your qualitative uh, research as well. So I think the, you have to understand that the value is in the speed. How do we, I, I have a pain point where every time we want to ask the users, we have to go back to our friends, and then they'll be like, ah, oh, today not free, next day. So it's also better to get a database of users where then when you are looking at the prototype, you can just call them up and then create a good relationship with them. Therefore, you know, it's much easier to get people for, to interview. And every, after every research, you can ask if you can contact them for further research. This is also a litmus test whether your research went well. Research is one one on one interview itself is the experience. If they had a great experience, they would want to come back. And they would also refer friends to come back for further research. And finally, create efficient space. So um, I draw inspiration from other industry. I was asking myself which other industry has already solved this problem where they have to learn as fast as possible in a short period of time. Anyone want to venture a guess? What industry it is? Or do you have answers in your head? So crime, crime scene, crime, murder investigation. Um, if you read about it, there's this rule that after 48 hours, if you don't have a uh, su suspect in mind, it's probably an unsolved case. So the investigation, the investigator team will cram everyone together in the room. And then you see this part here. They will have like suspect photos on the walls and they will stand around and start thinking about, huh, which one have the biggest motivation? It's actually very similar to researcher, isn't it? So my idea room would be a research or a learning room would be a room like this with pictures of our users plastered all over the wall. And then the POs, developers will stand together and, ha, ah, why did this user use our, our product? And they also have interrogation room, which is similar to our one-on-one -on -one interview. And I want to create such an environment in SP design. So we are looking at inspirations to create a space for learning where the users are on the wall all the time, 
the journey is on the wall all the time, screenshots and everything, it's there. So when you go into that room, you feel like, okay, this is a room where I have to find out the motivation, improve the product, change the matrix. And we, we did war rooms quite frequently. Next, designing faster. And here I want to put, again, time box on how fast you should be. Because as mentioned, my fast is not the same as your fast. This is a concept that we did for SP. So basically, we want to start talking about renewables in different towns, different districts. And when you have renewable data, when you have data on consumption and demand, then you can play around with pricing. So this is a concept for maybe three to five years down the road, which we drew up in four hours. This is property guru listing details, which we created in one hour. A shout out to property guru. This is launched recently, so you can check it out, but it doesn't take a lot of time. This is another concept around payment. And the concept, this design is created in about 30 minutes. This is another energy app where you can track your life consumption. If you have solar panel installed in your home, you can check how much this solar panel is contributing towards your home electricity. And then this is basically a mirror of the screenshot that I showed earlier where you can see the different districts and how they are using energy. And it's about two hours. So how fast your design is actually depends on how fast you can turn out design as individual. If you are a con sole contributor, it's literally how fast you can come, the de come out with the design. But if you are working with a design team, then it can get very chaotic. And again, I draw inspirations in another industry that have already solved these problems. So the kitchen, where have, you have to come up with dishes that are consistent in a very time pressured environment. If you are building a design team, these are some of the questions and some of the steps that you have to sit together, talk about, and ensure that everybody follow the same thing. So number one, the tools that you're gonna use. I would lean heavily towards Sketch, our sponsor. I mean, it's a great, <laughs> where's the Sketch? Okay, lifetime license. Uh. Um, I mean, I've used Photoshop, I've used Sketch, and Sketch just, Prevails, and this is a reason why everybody is using Sketch now. And someone just shared with me um, there was this job requirement where one of the requirements is you need to use Sketch. If not, we are not even going to consider you. So that is how powerful Sketch is. But I feel like, you know, keep an open mind, always be testing new tools to see whether it suits you better. So tools like Envision, Flinto, you know, make it consistent so everybody is using the same thing. Then the shared files, this is like a simple. Simple thing, but when we were reviewing shared files and all the features, you know, everybody has their own preferences. But as a design lead, you have to ask them to come together and stick with one. Photo structure, so you know where everybody, everything is. It's like in the kitchen, you know, this is your spoon, this is the stove. So it actually helps in efficiency. File naming convention, this is another big thing. Have you worked with designers where it's that messy? They don't actually put things into the folder, and each of the group actually have like so many layers of groups, and then you have a, can you clean up your files? So I make them clean up the files so that each designers know where things are and know how these are organized. And this actually plays a lot of difference if you are moving things from, say, Sketch to Zeppelin, where then the file folder structure makes a lot of difference. <clears throat> the next thing that you, which is very important that you need to actually sit down and, and talk about and be consistent is the grid system. So there's different, different grid system. All of them are right. There's no right or wrong answer. But as a design team, we need to find one that works for every products that you are doing. So we have uh, web products, we have mobile apps, and we did a little shortcut here. We are using the 12-column grid system and if you can see, 
This four column is the same as the mobile system. So what you need to do when doing mobile responsive, a lot of time is just copy and paste and put it on the same thing. Much faster. <coughs> Pattern library. Pattern library, a lot have been said. I need to repeat, it's very important. You can see your colors as your basic ingredients in the dish. I literally named them salt and pepper. And, and when you have the basic ingredients, you compile it into components that you review, reuse all the time. So these are the components that we used, not only in mobile web and mobile app, we also use them in web. And um, these are just examples of some of the components. It's more extensive than this. And what you can do, and glad Sketch has finally come up with this, is symbols and libraries. How many of you are using libraries? Amazing, right? I literally broke out the champagne and yes, we have this now. A lot of work needs to be done beforehand. So all your components need to be organized. So for buttons, you can see we have buttons, we have the different buttons. Um, for primary buttons, we have the different state. So you can use this library in most all, all your design files, and you just have to select. Um, our design system is called LumiKit. So select LumiKit, button, blah, 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 and then just paste it. That's why design can be so fast now. Design system is like your product. You need to be a product owner of it. And it is not healthy for the design team to be leading this. You need your developers buy-in. You need them to actually give you um, feedback on how to improve it so that they feel like they own this system. If not, the design system will just die. Some more ways of designing faster. So I mentioned this create a design system and then check out plugins that will help you. Use free resources. I noticed graphic designer are a bit egoistic about this. I will ask my designer to, hey, Download some free stuff. Ah. Then they're like, I can create all this. Why do I need to download? So this is actually an amazing set of icons that I found. It's completely free. The designer probably spent weeks on this. And I'm like, just use it. And finally, Leaving Style Guide worked with the developers to come up with something that is usable for all the developers. In Property Guru, we have a designed style guide that when you change the elements, it changed across four sites, four markets. All right, so that is designing fast, and finally, measuring fast. Here's a game. This is a Tinder profile. Which is better? What do you think? If you think the left side is a better picture, put up your hand. No one? Okay. If you think the right side is a better picture, put up your hand. Okay. So let me give you some numbers and then you can decide further. All right. So the one with a kid has 100 impressions, means 100 people have seen it, and five matches. Five matches means they actually um, swipe, swipe right, swipe right. And then the one without kid is. 230 and 8 matches. So at this point, what do you think? Which is, which is better? If you think the one with the kid is better, put out your hand. And if you think the one without the kid is better, put out your hand. All right. So uh, calculation. So if you calculate conversion rate, the one with kid is actually much higher, actually double the conversion. So it works better. And where do I get this data? Again, inspiration for myself. So I was at Property Guru, and developers will start talking about, hey, can we do a Tinder for properties or not? They're like, Tinder for properties, Tinder for properties. And I've not on, I haven't been on Tinder. So I'm like, OK, I need to find out what they're talking about. So I created an account. And I, it, it uses your Facebook 
profile picture, so it was without the kid. And then I start to get messages and matches. And I'm like, okay, this is awkward. I don't know what to do with them. And I want to make it very clear that I'm not available. So I chose a profile with my child. And nightmare. I started getting more matches and more messages. And what is wrong with these people? <laughs> so some of the traits of good UX matrix, you have to remember that the matrix actually changed the way you design. So if I do a certain activity, what does it do to this matrix? And we have different matrix. One is the counting matrix, where you measure week after week, month after month. And some are experimental matrix, where you say, OK, let's test this out. And if it works, then you're not going to measure it anymore. So A-B testing is one of that. If you are doing like version, version, version by version iteration, and you're just measuring specific thing, if it meets the matrix that you are aiming for, then you don't have to measure it anymore. And the good UX matrix, the design matrix, actually follows the customer journey. So I'll give you more example. Who are, just, just a show of hand, who is actually acquainted with data analytics and using data analytics for your design? OK. Um, it's actually not a personality trait of designers to be very acquainted with data, myself included. So the easiest way is just start with one. And the safest matrix are probably engagement matrix. If you are designing an application that needs um, weekly engagement, daily engagement, or conversion matrix, where you are doing some sort of a marketplace model, you have e-commerce, how much conversion you have out of each user. So just start with one, measure it every week, and get a sense around it. Matrix and numbers should be something that you can actually tangible, you can feel it with your hands. And a good designer will tell you that, okay, to change this matrix, I have to do something to change it. And next, you can put a framework around it after you are acquainted with that one matrix. This is the UX hard matrix by Google. I find it useful for people who are stepping into this data and analytics role. But again, it's not enough. So this is the user experience journey for SP user. We have where they start to seek utilities where they start to evaluate. Now you have no choice. There's just SP Group. We have such an easy job. But next year, the market will be open. So all of you will have other um, retailers to actually choose from. And then on board, how does the user go about creating their utilities account? And then the actual usage of electricity, payment, billing, so on. So. I mean, if you are a UX designer, you probably have a version of this somewhere. Maybe it's in a wall event. But the problem with UX journey is a lot of time it's not actionable. So what we try to make it actionable is, number one, put the business view on top. So you have the user view, and you also have the business view. So when you talk to your business stakeholder and say, hey, guys, we need to improve stage, use, and monitor. They're not going to understand and they're not going to care. It's not really in them to empathize with that. But if you say, this is actually user retention, uh, that's where they start to pay attention. Or payment, this is your revenue. Share, this is user growth. This is where they start to understand how important it is to be empathetic towards user view. The next thing we do is, at the matrix at the bottom. So it gives us a sense of, if I want to know whether use and monitor is successful, then these are the things that I can look out for. So here, I, I know it's too small. We have active users, sessions per user, consumption for users, savings per user, and so on. And I have all these tallied into a spreadsheet that looks like this in Google Sheets. It's very easy to create. 
It takes you about 30, it takes you about maybe two days to set up everything correctly. But when you are measuring, you just simply have to run the report. It takes you a minute and all these numbers will be tallied. A few things to note about matrix, you have to run your reports every week at the same time. If it's a two-week sprint, then the first Monday at that time, 10 o'clock maybe, you have to sit there and run the report and get those numbers. If it's a weekly, then every Monday. And then after that, you can get a week-by-week -week comparison. Week one, conversion per, per user. These are all fake data, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing, <laughs> I can't show anything. So um, first week, 6.55 conversion. Second week, it's higher. Why is it higher? What did I do? And then it goes low. Why? Why is it lower? What did I do? And this gives you a lot more objectivity in your design, which makes, you, which makes designer very powerful. I love a designer who will come out to me and say, hey, let's try this new onboarding, because I realized that our conversion, our onboarding is getting lower, and we need to do something. And finally, you know, I'm looking at inspiration again, stock markets. Stock market is an industry where you look at the design, you look at the metric, and that second you need to do something. So we have dashboards like this in SP Digital, and all developers, POs, designers could crowd around and say, aha, you know, this week, downloads is increasing because we did a marketing, we did a new campaign. Engagement is increasing because of these things that we did last spring, this hypothesis that we tested. So it makes a team a lot more objective about their product design. And that's it. That is the cycle. Learn, measure, learn build, and measure. But if you are already using this, and you are using this successfully, and you're still not getting traction, which is what I am right now, I'm thinking in an organization, where can I go beyond Lean? Lean itself is quite easy to understand and practice, but if you keep doing this week after week, you realize that you feel like a hamster in a wheel. You're just running and running and running to where? Sometimes to nowhere. So it's important to have a vision, maybe three, five years down the road, and see whether what all the experiments that you're running now could go into that vision. So here, I'm going to give you an example. This was the vision we did, and the stakeholder was CEO of um, SP Group. We had, a, we had a few concepts, and then we show um, whether it matches his vision in five years. So this is something that we tested. We want to show more information about how each of the districts are using their energy, whether they are sustainable as well. So green is more than 5% contributed from renewables, and then orange is less than 5%. It's so all fake data, but it's something that we are going to start to build. And then in the community, so imagine you are living in Sengkang. It can go into the different buildings and see whether this building is you know, sustainable versus that building is sustainable. It brings a little bit of gamification as well. Imagine you are block A, and then you realize block C is very sustainable. Maybe you can have some activities to like, you know, really catch up to it. It contributes to a bigger purpose of sustainability. And here is the family view. So each of you, each of the family will have their own mobile app to also measure how sustainable they are. And we're also looking at renewables, such as solar panels, which you can buy and put in your home and contribute to your electricity, so your bill will be lower. So uh, we had a showcase in Singapore Energy Week. And I'm saying design can be bigger because if you talk to stakeholders, they find that you are actually very powerful without building actual things in the island, you can make their concepts and their vision tangible. And I feel like this is something that only designers can do, not even developers. 
and we should really embrace that. And here, after using, after showing the concepts, um, we showcase it in Energy Week, and that this senior minister of state, we talk to her, and she's opening the doors for us. She's like, okay, you have to talk to this, you have to talk to EMA, and and how can we make this faster? How can we actually create an ecosystem of energy awareness in Singapore? So how do you sharpen the feature? vision? Each of the lean cycle actually refines and sharpens your own long-term strategy. So if you talk about qualitative um, research that are very in-depth, like ethnographic study, but I think as you go through cycle by cycle, all this data actually accumulates into something that can sharpen your vision towards the future. You designers should probably spend more time learning about the business strategy so that you are empathetic towards your business as well. Talk to stakeholders, talk to key account, C-level, if you have um, access to them. And mentioned, help the business stakeholders bring the vision to life. You are actually the only person who can do it. And when they share with you and say, okay, can you actually come out with concepts, you are actually helping them and they will see the value in what you can do. And that's it. So, in summary, learn, build, measure, put a number to it. It could be two weeks. If you are even faster, it could be a week. If you are faster, challenge yourself, it could be even be faster. But uh, I think according to Scrum and Lean, anything more than two weeks, you lose the momentum. So try to make it faster. So some of the rules of the games, the speed, challenge, always challenging yourself, always compete with your own speed, validation, and vision. And finally, I hope that end of next year, when you ask yourself what you have learned during the year, you can actually put a lot more learnings into one year where you can exponentially have 10 years of experience in a year. I've talked to graduates who are in lean cycle who learn so much and is actually comparable to people who are in the industry for years and years. And I hope after today, we have the mindset to actually learn faster and gain much more in our work. Thank you. Any question? Do I have time for question, Gil? Okay, hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. Okay, I'm just wondering when you talk about um, doing things in a lean approach, doing things in a, a very short time span. So have you had any experience where you have to work with a very big project and it needs to be done in a short time? So what would be the approach to cater for that kind of problem? Thank you. So um, by default, a lot of the SP projects are very big projects. We are talking about electric vehicles, which affect government policy, it affects um, the supply of electric vehicles that we have, but we always start small. So we have our own fleet of electric vehicles in the SP, and we have also created an app for internal use and see how they are using it first. And we will answer questions like, how do I actually make them charge the EV? Should it be in car park, multi-story car park? Should it be in residential home? And these are the questions that will be surfaced with these 15 um, users of EV vehicles. Another one, another project that we are looking at are solar panels. And we have deployed them to about a beta set of users, 12 of them. So we put them in their home and then we will be measuring um, the consumption trends and we will be validating with um, residents whether they would even buy solar panels. FYI, you can actually buy solar panels for IKEA now, but it's other countries. So we are actually testing that and see what is the outcome. Maybe it doesn't work in Singapore at, at all because we are living in apartments and they don't see um, the use of having something in their home. So there are a lot of creative ways to test things simply. Sometimes if you want to test a product value, you can just launch a Facebook advertisement, say, 
solar kit for $50 a month, sign up now, and it goes into nowhere. But then you will see whether there's an interest there, and you can follow up with these users to see whether they want to actually put a solar app into their home and test it with us. So there's a lot of creative ways to actually get the minimum viable product out without even building anything. Uh, I've got one question. So in all of your experiences, like because you're from the design team, how do you talk to the engineers or the developers into crafting out certain features in a certain way? And you know, how do you make sure that there is um, no miscommunication and all that? I think I, whatever I share now will be shared with the developers so they understand the thinking behind it and they understand why we do things certain ways. We also get them to feedback on the processes. So, you know, it's a two-way thing, right? This is what we think we should, we should work together. Sometimes they have other opinions. So we are saying the last time we wanted to push everything to Zeppelin, there were a lot of pushback as well. Like, why are we using Zeppelin? Why don't you just do this? this, this? And then we had a presentation. From there, we gather their feedback, and then we hash things out. I think it is one way of building the trust. This is officially. Unofficially, I think, you know, connect them as people, as friends, go out, you know, have lunch with them, know them as in a personal level, as a colleague. Then usually it will just make things a lot more easier. And it's not only developers, but also your business owners, your product owners. This is why we have team building, team bonding, retrospective, but sometimes it goes a lot to just have lunch with them and know them as a person and not a developer. Any more questions? Uh, you mentioned name design, but by this chat, where were you putting the research portion? Because most of those processes you have to explain was mainly on the design stage, but not towards the research by process in the test day. So the research comes in the learn part. Research actually comes in here, snippets of it. So we always start with discovery questions. We will ask users, um, say if we are looking for bill payment, we will ask them when was the last time they, they pay their bills, and then can you walk through what is the journey? It goes from the trigger, how do you remember you need to pay your bills? And then what do you do next? Then next, 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 next. And then you have like a whole set of picture or journey for this specific person. This is where we get the context. Um, it depends if it is a early on in the process, then you get to ask questions that are much earlier on. So wh why do you remember when you need to open a utility account? And we get people who have just opened a utility account. If you ask someone who already have an account for years, they're not going to remember. So every sprint, every two weeks, you have little insights like this. And you accumulate all that to give you a complete richer data. And these data will be validated by numbers. So I've also done ethnographic studies, which are very, very rich. But the problem is it takes a long time so I think you can do both, but you have to remember that Lean is probably a separate track. And at the same time, you could have an agency to do more in-depth study. So for the design team in, in digital, we are doing Lean, but we have also engaged agencies to do more in-depth ethnographic study. The thing about ethnographic study is you can do it one time. If there's no disruption in the industry, that behavior is not going to change. So you don't have to keep doing it every month because if you are not creating a product to actually disrupt that behavior, they're not going to change. 
So it would be more of a one-time investment. Hi. Uh, what is the difference between lean design and the lean UX that is already established? So lean UX doesn't actually move beyond the deployment of the product. So if I talk about accounting matrix, this is more into the matrix that the product owner have, have are tracking. I think this is a good um, diagram. So Lean UX sits somewhere around here. Lean UX is somewhere around here. And design thinking sits quite in front. So design thinking, you have your ethnographic studies, you have your contextual in inquiry. Lean UX, you start doing the learning part that we do. So you come up with the concepts, you run design sprints, you test those concepts with the users, and then that's where the Lean UX actually stops and you bring those um, designs to the developers. The problem is you don't actually get to see the product being built and the product being used by users. So some of the matrix that you are using in Lean UX are what we call experimental matrix. It could be A-B testing, but A-B testing is not the final product. So you have A-B testing, say, you test two versions of a design, and then maybe 10% of existing user for one, 10% for another, to be safe, right? Because A-B testing, um, to reduce the risk, you don't want to roll it out to 100% of the users. And you realize that option A is working and you decided to roll out option A to the rest of the population. But then you have to measure whether this option A changes an accounting metric. So this option A that you have tested and validated should change the behavior of the users who are using the final product. And this is where Lean UX stops because they're not measuring the, the until. So I also work at an enterprise, well I work at an enterprise startup and oftentimes um, it's really hard to anticipate um, talking with enterprise customers um, and finding the recruitment, scheduling and actually uh, scheduling it internally as well um, with their stakeholders and so it often disrupts the whole process or sprint so it, it just ends up um, extending to another sprint and another sprint. Um, so I wonder, like in your work setting, how does how that affects you guys? I'm sure um, it often turns out to be a problem, and um, yeah, how do you deal with it? For enterprise, they usually connect through an account manager or a salesperson, and I think we need to respect their relationship because a lot of time the account manager and the salesperson would think that they can speak for the users and a lot of time it is often the case, they know a lot about the users and I think firstly um, respect the relationship that account managers or salesperson have with the user and talk to them and ask them questions. You know, they should be one of your main stakeholders and there will be questions that they can answer, there will be questions that they can't answer and from there say, oh, you know, I still have this specific question, would you mind if the next time you see the user, you know, ask this question or can we just sit in in your sales pitch, can we sit in when you have a meeting, I will just be an observer, I'm not going to even speak to the users because these are their accounts and they are very, you know, they, they want to hold it, they want to be the authority over it, and I think we need to respect that. And once you have that mindset, it's usually simpler. Um, they will be, okay, you know, I see that these are some of the questions to help you, you know, I will bring you in and I will share more with you. Again, it's also the one-to-one -one relationship you have with the account and the salesperson. So for me, I always go out with the sales, head of sales, you know, try to connect with them, learn about their problems. Um, whenever I have a new designer, we get schedule stakeholder interview. 
to ask each of these stakeholders, if you're head of sales, what are the problems that you're trying to solve? And how can I help you? If you are a business strategy, how can I help you? It's, it's, it's also user experience in that way, but it's internal. Thank you. No questions? Thank you. Thanks, everyone.